a pleasure to be able to speak with you all today, and Lauren and I will be discussing ecological approaches to water treatment. So to give you an overview of why we're concerned and why we need to have options for water treatment, um, we're going to discuss a little bit about water challenges that are prevalent in agriculture today. So there are basically two concerns. We have water quality and water quantity. For water quality, we face issues with clean water for plant production and also for environmental conservation. So depend up, de depending upon whether we are talking about water used for irrigation or production runoff, contaminant presence is a concern. The major contaminants include nutrients, pesticides, which include herbicides and fungicides, and also pathogens or other biotic pests, including weed seeds. Many of these contaminants can be addressed with various treatment processes, and we are going to be talking about the ecologically-based treatment processes today. Thus, if we treat water or runoff so it can be reused, we are helping to address quantity issues and helping to conserve our water resources. And because competition is going to increase in the coming years for these limited water resources, we need to have good treatment options in place today. There are multiple runoff contributors which impact um, water quality and can and contaminant presence in the environment, i.e. our surface and our groundwater, um, can be detrimentally impacted by them. And the sources of runoff can include production runoff, such as nurseries or um, agricultural runoff. And we also have urban runoff and residential runoff at the same time. And all of these are considered non-point source contributors to runoff. And because this runoff is from a diffuse area or not a distinct area or a pipe, it is sometimes hard to regulate. However, they are still able to contribute to, negative, uh, to negatively impacting water quality. And since nutrient contaminants from the above sources have promoted nutrient enrichment of various water sources, we need to determine how we can treat them or reuse nutrients so that we're not in negatively impacted, impacting our surface waters. So nutrient, nutrient discharges can increase eutrophication, and eutrophication is a natural process, but when nutrient enrichment, enrichment occurs at a faster rate than it would naturally, hyper-eutrophication can occur. And hyper-eutrophication promotes rapid algal growth, and once an algal bloom occurs, um, you can have the algal populations will go through a growth cycle and they will eventually die and they will, the algae will fall to the bottom of a water column and rapidly add organic matter to a system. And this can ultimately result in potentially reduced dissolved oxygen concentrations in the water column, which can contribute to dead zones. But algae can also have potential human health effects if they are releasing cytotoxins as if you were in the Chesapeake Bay area. So that's why we want to, we're worried about nutrient enrichment. You also have pesticide contaminants, and pesticide contaminants can enter surface water via runoff from both agricultural and residential lands. And many commonly used pesticides can negatively impact both fish and microbial organisms. And that's why the EPA has approved um, re application rates for various pesticides because for both frequency and timing of the applications to help limit surface water contamination. Because many of these pesticides have detrimental impacts on aquatic life, both fish and invertebrates, we, the limits of, of how often they appear in the water or the concentrations when they appear in the water are very critical. So if we were to look at pendamesalin, if you looked at a chronic they've done testing and they've had chronic or if they've had this concentration, which is 6.3 parts per billion in the water column for more than seven days, you could have detrimental impacts on, um, on the fish populations. You could reduce their reproduction capabilities. So that's why there are regulations today regarding runoff capture and control from irrigated and agricultural operations. And these are not in all states, but they're primarily in California, Florida, Maryland, Oregon, and Texas. And they are just simply to reduce nutrient and pesticide runoff from operations. And then there are also waste discharge permits. And this is a, an additional step. So even though they, nurseries may be considered non-point source distributors, they're an identifiable non-point source contributor. And thus, they have to have a permit for how much water and the quality of water as it's released from their site. 
And there are also potential numeric nutrient criteria which would limit or regulate the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that are in a watershed or, um, or basically based on a water body type like a stream, a lake, or a brackish area in Florida. So all of these combine to make treatment options necessary or treatment of water necessary. And then if we look at pathogen contaminants, which if we're wanting to recycle runoff, pathogen contamination, if you're recycling your runoff, is very critical. And these are waterborne pathogens are perennial problems, and they re have resulted in billions of dollars in crop losses and will continue to do so. There are plenty of chemical treatment options, but these chemical treatment options can be expensive, and they, if they're not managed properly, you can have worker safety issues, and it's something that you will have to continually do. Thus, we get to our ecological treatment alternatives, and they're basically two alternatives we're going to talk about today. We have large-scale treatment systems, which are free water surface constructed wetlands, or basically constructed wetlands, and then small-scale treatment systems, which is slow sand filtration. So large-scale treatment systems are constructed wetlands, and basically this just means that constructed wetlands are made and implemented to mimic um, natural wetlands, because natural wetlands have various um, functions that are that work to actually treat and remove contaminants. So soils can provide habitats for microbes to grow, and these microbes can process nutrients on organic contaminants. The microbes can also be attached to vegetation, which will slow water and, pr and help promote sedimentation from the water column. And the vegetation can also, or the plants, can actually take up nutrients, trace metals, and sometimes some of the pesticides and helping to further cleanse the water. The beauty of constructed wetlands as a water management tool is that they can be tailored for specific contaminants. Loading rates, i.e., depends on how concentrated the water is as to how long the water would have to be, or how concentrated the contaminants are as to how long the water would need to be retained in the wetland. And it can be they can be tailored for high volumes or low volumes. They're also very low maintenance once they're installed, and they can treat runoff for both recycling or release, and the water quality of that should be adequate for actual use. So free water surface constructed wetlands or surface flow constructed wetlands, both of those are commonly used terms, are basically defined by having an inflow where you have water coming into a a treatment system that has a variety of, it can have algae growing in it, but basically the water flows through a basin that can be typically two to three feet deep, but it could get up to four feet deep and still provide adequate treatment capacity. But you have the vegetation, which provides the, the slowing of the water, but you also have the microbial populations that aid in um, helping remove contaminants. And then basically the water flows to the wetland and after about three days it is released and that can be either to a retention pond or a holding pond where it could be reused or released off-site where it can contribute to surface waters but be a clean source for surface waters. And we have done or I have participated in a research study that has done considerable work with wetlands, these surface flow wetlands, and we looked at a 9.3 acre constructed wetland that received runoff from 120 acres of production. And basically, we found that nitrogen removal efficiency was very, very high. So to let me orient you to the graph, we have basically five years of research and sampling where we went down and sampled on a monthly basis. We were able to determine that nitrogen was very efficiently removed. There was some cycling based on season with lower removal efficiencies, but we were always seeing removal to well below um, two parts per million nitrogen for the majority of the time. So constructed wetlands or surface flow constructed wetlands are very efficient with high to moderate runoff volumes. They're very efficient, efficient for nitrogen removal. Phosphorus, however, is not consistently treated, and pesticide removal can be 50 to 98 percent effective. It just depends upon the chemistry of the compound that you're looking at treating. Now, subsurface flow treatments have been used um, consistently for uh, since about the 70s, and they are able to treat all types of um, wastewater. Um, this particular picture is from uh, subsurface flow wetland that treats dairy and residential sewage in um, Israel, 
but they are very effective and basically you take a surface flow wetland and you have the same influence source but instead of having water in the whole column you actually have a gravel substrate or a clay substrate and you have a coarse pre-filter to remove hopefully any particulate or sediment or organic matter that might clog it and then you can plant the subsurface flow wetland and then the water flows through that and it's treated by the plant roots and also by the biotic films or that inhabit the plant roots and eventually it leaves this surf subsurface flow constructed wetland and can be used to for irrigation or released off site now subsurface flow wetlands are especially good for phosphorus removal if you tailor the 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 root bed media to perhaps a clay that can actually absorb phosphorus so subsurface flow wetlands are enhance phosphorus removal and if you plant them with plants you actually em enhance that phosphorus removal and can enhance the longevity of how effective the subsurface flow wetlands are for removing phosphorus but since phosphorus um, binding sites on the clay will saturate you will have to monitor phosphorus concentrations in the outflow so that you can replace the substrate when phosphorus is saturated so subsurface flows are ideal because they reduce ammoniacal nitrogen emissions, meaning that you'll have fewer greenhouse gases being released into the environment. It is efficient for both nitrogen and phosphorus, and it is efficient for pesticide removal, but again, that depends upon pesticide class and chemistry. But basically for large scale treatment systems, the free water surface constructed wetlands, they require a large land area, but they're very effective for nitrogen remediation, pesticide remediation, and we're looking at the pathogen remediation in these systems currently, and that's my current line of research. And subsurface low constructed wetlands may be able to use a smaller land footprint, so you don't have to dedicate as much land, but they're effective for both nitrogen and phosphorus remediation. Um, we have an additional resource that we just put out, Constructed Wetlands, a how-to guide for nursery for nurseries so that we can walk you through the steps of how to put in and design a constructed wetland for your particular nursery and that will be available in December um, and that's basically the basic primer for large-scale treatment systems and please don't hesitate to contact me if you have questions or I can help you.